If you're looking to buy a new camera or your first camera and you want to make sure it's perfect, make sure to watch this video. We're going to break down the seven key features that you should look for in your camera based on what you need and what you're shooting. So whether you're looking to buy your first camera and you want to make sure it's perfect or you're already shooting and you just want to see what's new in the camera world, well, I've got you covered. Also, I'm going to leave links in the description down below for all the camera gear that we talk about today. So if you want the best pricing and the most up-to-date pricing on your camera gear, then be sure to check out the links in the description down below. All right, guys, so let's jump right into it. The goal with this video is to teach you guys how to fundamentally pick your camera. We're gonna talk about seven key features that will determine if the camera is right for you or not right for you. And even as camera technology evolves and even as newer cameras come out, you can still use this information and apply it to future cameras. DSLR are big, bulky, very robust cameras and they were originally made in the 80s and this is kind of the camera technology that everyone is used to. They have this very loud shutter sound but other than that, they don't really provide a big technology boost or they don't provide any kind of advantage. Most camera companies no longer make DSLR. So if you buy DSLR, make sure you're getting it used or secondhand because there's no point in buying a brand new fresh off the shelf DSLR anymore. And the second camera is the mirrorless. This is what most cameras on the market right now look like. The reason they're called mirrorless is simply because they don't have that single lens reflex mirror that DSLRs have that create that loud shutter sound. Mirrorless cameras, however, do come with a huge technology benefit, which I'll talk about later, but just know that you're able to shoot faster, better autofocus, better low light, pretty much everything a DSLR does, it does better, and mirrorless cameras are generally also smaller. And lastly, you have point and shoot cameras. These are your small compact cameras with fixed lenses. Most cameras allow you to change your lens, but point and shoots do not. However, that perceived con does come with a huge advantage where point and shoots are extremely small, extremely compact, and despite having a fixed lens, those lenses usually have a great zoom range, very fast aperture, point and shoot lenses are often very great. And lastly, there's gadget cameras like a GoPro or a DJI Osmo. These cameras aren't really known for the image quality, they're really known for being extremely small and extremely compact where you can actually make them action cameras, like you can use them while snowboarding and surfing without any issue, and they're extremely robust you can throw them in water you can drop them they're totally fine now having talked about the different kinds of cameras let's take a look at what's inside every single camera out there so you can figure out if the camera you're looking at is right for you so first up let's talk about the sensor the sensor is basically the eyes of the camera it's the main piece of technology that actually captures your images now every camera sensor is made of millions and millions of megapixels some cameras have a low megapixel count like five or six and these cameras usually don't look very good and some cameras have a much higher megapixel count like 24 to 25 and these tend to have a lot more detail a lot more sharpness the reason for that is the megapixels is the main thing that determines how much detail and how much information that camera is capturing. Based on when you're seeing this video, there might be cameras out there that are 200 megapixels, but in the modern day and age, five and six is pretty low. 12 is like an iPhone. 24 to 30 is pretty decent. It's what most mid-size and professional cameras have. 30 is a really good megapixel count. However, there are cameras out there that are as high as 50 to 100 megapixels. However, those are generally professional tools that cost a ton of money. But how do you know if you need a high resolution or a low resolution camera? Because resolution doesn't always mean quality. As long as you have somewhere between 20 to 24 megapixels, your images for photos and videos are going to look just fine. But there are two main reasons I do recommend people get a high resolution camera. And the first reason is cropping. If you start off with a high resolution 24 or 30 megapixel image, and then you zoom into that image by doing a crop in Photoshop, Lightroom, whatever app you're using, you're not going to lose the information and detail in that image. Because if you get too close or you crop in too much, your images is going to start to lose information and get pixelated and just simply look bad. So if you're going to be doing a lot of cropping, make sure to start off with a high resolution image. And the second reason is pretty similar. If you're going to be touching up your photos, maybe fixing up skin, changing small details like jewelry, taking hairs out, or maybe even photoshopping people out of landscapes, you're going to want a high resolution camera so that you can really get in there and fine tune your image. However, if you don't need to do either of those things, then a 20 to 24 megapixel camera will be just fine for you. And if you're trying to figure out if the camera you're looking at is high resolution or low resolution, naturally look at the megapixel count, but also look at what format it gives you the photos and videos in. Video generally comes in full HD or 4K. 
sometimes you will see 8K or 10K video. The higher the number, the more information, the higher resolution that video is. You generally want to look for the higher number. If you see something like 480p or 720p, that is low resolution. You should stay away from that camera. If you're looking at photos, you'll generally see the number of the sensor followed by megapixel photo. So if you have a 24 megapixel camera, 24 megapixel photo. If you notice that the megapixel count on the photos is lower than what it says on the sensor, most likely it's giving you low resolution photos and you don't want to get that camera. But here's the one key thing that a lot of people don't talk about when talking about sensors. Sensors come in different sizes. You've got full frame, which is the largest and most professional. Then you have APS-C, which majority of cameras have. And then you've got micro four thirds, which is a very small sensor. Each sensor has its own advantages. Personally, I don't like micro four thirds sensors because they're so small and they don't have the ability to gather as much light because you're trying to get light onto a smaller piece of technology. I personally like APS-C or full frame because there's a bigger piece of silicone catching that light, you're going to naturally get better light performance. However, for most people, an APS-C sensor is just fine. If you're vlogging, doing food videos, commercials, all of that will be just fine with an APS-C because it's the largest sensor you can get at a really good price point. The only time you really need a full frame is if you're going to be blowing up an image and printing it out and putting it up on a wall. Because full frame is a larger sensor, naturally it lets you see more of the things around you. Full frame is really beneficial for portraits, landscapes, or anytime you just need to capture a big space. Other than that, APS-C is just fine. However, sensors are only half the equation when it comes to making an image. The other thing you have to look at is the lens that goes in front of your sensor. Lenses determine a lot about how your image actually looks. It determines if it's a wide shot, a close-up shot, what your depth of field is, how much light you can let into your sensor. It determines a lot of your image. And I always recommend to people that you should get a cheap camera and an expensive lens. New cameras come out pretty much every other year. But lenses tend to come out every five to six years. So if you get a really nice lens, you know for a fact that you're going to have the best image making tool for a long time to come. Now you have two kinds of lenses, prime lens and zoom lenses. Zoom lenses let you zoom and prime lenses are one fixed focal length, which means you can't zoom in and out. For most of you guys, I actually do recommend getting a zoom lens because with modern lens technology, zoom lenses are actually pretty good. If you're vlogging, if you're doing something that's very run and gun, documentary, vacations, family and friends, you want to get a zoom lens so you can easily get a close up, a wide shot. You want a lens that can kind of hang with all of it. You don't really need a prime lens unless you're doing portraits, professional work, something where you really, really need to make it look good. The benefit of prime lenses is that it lets you have more depth of field, AKA that shallow depth of field, the blurry background effect, and also prime lenses, because there's less going into them, generally tend to have better quality for less money. However, I will say this, the prices that I'm mentioning are subject to change depending on what year you're watching this, what's going on in the world. So make sure to check out the links below for the right prices. And if you wanna save money on your lenses, I actually do like the kit lenses that most cameras come with. They're not amazing lenses, but they kind of do a little bit of everything. And for anyone that's just starting out, get yourself a cheap, medium price camera and just go with a kit lens until you figure out what you really want to shoot and what kind of images you want to get. Okay, so we got the technical math stuff out of the way. You know what a sensor does. You know what kind of sensor you want to be looking for. You know what kind of lenses you want to look for. But there's a lot more that goes into a camera. There's a couple of things I want to talk about, which is colors, how fast your camera can shoot, and low light, which is how good does your camera look without a lot of light if you're shooting at nightclubs, parties, or even out on the streets. The less light you give a camera, the worse it's going to look. Now, most cameras have something on it known as an ISO, which is the light sensitivity of your camera itself. Now, here's the thing. If you lower the ISO to something like 100, 200, you're going to need a lot of light to get a good image. But when you raise your ISO really high, you start to get a lot of static in your image, a lot of pixelation, a lot of color banding, which makes your image look really bad. So you want a camera that looks clean as in no artifacts or color noise at a high ISO. Most cameras have a max ISO of about 2000, maybe 2500, and after that they tend to look pretty bad. However, Sony cameras can go as high as 10,000. If you want a low light camera, without a doubt, you should look at either the Sony a7S II, the Sony a7S III, or anything from the Sony a6400 or a6000 line in general, because Sony cameras tend to look the best in low light situations. The technology in the Sony cameras is something other brands simply don't have, therefore they're kind of leading the market 
in this aspect of cameras. If you don't have a Sony camera or don't want to get a Sony camera, the other thing you can do is get a lens with a fast aperture, somewhere between f2 to f2.8. This will allow more light to come in and you will get a nicer image. However, lenses that have a fast aperture do tend to cost more. The best way to get a lens that has a fast aperture is to get a prime lens since prime lenses cost less overall and generally have a faster aperture across the line. And next up, let's talk about colors. One of the things that I hear the most from you guys is how do you get your photos to look like that? How do you get those colors? How do you get it to look vintage? The truth is it all comes down to your colors. Some camera companies like Panasonic, red cameras have pretty abysmal colors. I have a red camera, this is no shade, but they have pretty bad colors. And some camera companies are known for having spectacular color like Canon and Fuji. A lot of the times, if you're going to be editing your images, editing your colors in Photoshop, Lightroom, or whatever photo app you use, it doesn't really matter what colors you have because you can just change it down the line. But if you're someone that doesn't want to put in that much work, like me, or you just want your photos to look good in camera, you don't want to edit them, period, ever, then I would definitely recommend looking into a camera brand that's better with colors like Canon or Fuji. For video, you still wanna look at the color bit depth of your camera, but because it's not raw photo, the bit depth will be much lower, like 8-bit or 10-bit. However, in the future, we might have 32-bit. This is just a number you wanna keep in mind. Along with that, you wanna look at cinema profiles in this camera. Some cameras have a neutral or flat profile, like Cinema 1, Cinema 4. This will depend on what camera you're picking up, but you wanna look for a high bit depth for colors if you wanna do a lot of adjustment to your colors and you want to look for something akin to a flat profile or a log profile in video cameras. So now that we've talked about the features that you need to look at to figure out if this camera is going to give you an image that you actually like to look at, like sensor size, resolution, low light colors, let's figure out the shooting speed of your camera. This will determine how fast your camera shoots because if you're shooting anything with a lot of movement, you're going to want a faster shooting speed. Shooting speed is exactly what it sounds like. How fast does your camera shoot? For photos, because it's only one frame at a time, you tend to have speed somewhere between five frames to 10 frames per second, with some cameras that are really high end having as high as 15 frames per second. Now this is basically how many times a second your camera is taking a photo. So if you wanna be capturing something with like a lot of movement, like sports, car, for photos you want something closer to 10 frames a second because it's going to take 10 frames every second and it's going to be able to capture that action all the way through that movement. However, for video, it's drastically different. Most likely, you've managed to figure out that video is just one photo after another. However, you need a constant number of frames every second to make video seem fluid. Video frame rate can go as low as 24 frames per second, and this is generally what you see in movie theaters and is what most of our eyes are accustomed to. If video is faster than 24, it tends to have this very artificial look to it. 30 frame rates is generally what you see news, reality shows, just everyday kind of stuff in. 60 is generally a frame rate that you see in gaming, which again, this is not about gaming, but it's, it's a frame rate that you see in gaming or really high-end theaters like IMAX. Because the video is so constant, it feels so real, you can have a really immersive experience by having really fast or high refresh rate video. But I'll say this, most people that shoot casual content, content for YouTube, try to make beautiful art, usually tend to use high frame rate to do slow motion. Now to explain how exactly high frame rate gives you slow motion is kind of a complicated topic, so I won't talk about it in this video, but if you guys wanna see a video on that, let me know, it's one of my favorite topics. But all you really need to know is, if you're shooting yourself, maybe you're vlogging, just everyday YouTube content, and you don't need any kind of slow motion, you're totally fine shooting at 24 or 30 frames per second. Generally, 24 to 30 seconds of frame rate also tend to give you a higher resolution image. So video frame rate and shooting speed help you capture faster moving objects and help you catch a lot of motion without missing any specific moments. However, when you're tracking something with a lot of movement, it's hard to keep things in focus. And that's where autofocus comes in. Autofocus is the camera's automatic system for keeping objects, people, things in focus. Autofocusing is kind of confusing because there's no specific numbers I can give you other than focus points. 
that determine whether or not this camera is good. And focus points don't actually tell you about the quality of the autofocus. The way to determine if a camera is good at autofocus or not is to generally watch camera reviews or try out the camera yourself. You can go to a local camera shop, ask a friend who has the camera, and just ask them to show you how good the autofocus is. Brands to look out for that generally have very good autofocus is Canon and Sony. Sony has the best autofocus system in the world. Out of even professional high-end cameras, Sony has the best autofocus system on planet Earth. Canon is a pretty close second. If Canon is 10 out of 10, Sony's like 15 out of 10. Below that is Fuji, and they do a pretty great job, like 7 to 7.5, but they're not amazing. But the reason most people get Fuji cameras is because the image is amazing, and it makes up for the bad autofocus, similar to Panasonic. One thing that you guys might find interesting is a lot of times, the more expensive a video camera gets, the worse the autofocus gets because on professional film and TV sets, you're not gonna use autofocus. You're gonna use a real person to change the focus on the lens so that it's exactly what it needs to be every single time. So funny enough, cameras that are 20,000, 30,000, even 100,000 that are used by professional movies have no autofocusing system on them. The last thing I wanna talk to you guys about, and this is very, very, very important, is design because if you have a poorly designed camera you could have the best image quality coming out of it but you won't want to use it because it's designed poorly so here's a couple of things you should look out for when deciding on the design of a camera now as i talked to you guys about earlier there's dslr's point and shoots and mirrorless dslr is pretty big and chunky and definitely has some heft to it but if you like that feel in your hands go with the DSLR, it will also cost you less and it's a great camera type. If you're someone that wants to save a lot of weight but you also want the newest technology, go with the mirrorless. Not only are you getting cutting edge technology in your camera, but you're also going to save quite a bit of weight, but you are going to be paying premium prices, whereas with the DSLR, you're going to get a generally better deal on it. Lastly, if you're someone that just does not care, like I just want my camera to be easy, go with a point of two camera. They're small, they're still relatively inexpensive, and you won't have to worry about changing lenses. Now, what minor thing I wanna talk about, and this is probably not a thing that most people think about, but it makes a huge difference to their camera, is the SD card slot. I recommend looking for a camera that has an SD card on the side so even if your camera's on a tripod or in a cage you can quickly open up that side door and change out sd cards and if you're a professional and you want to have maybe more than one sd card in your camera make sure you get an sd card with two slots and a lot of cameras will actually let you dual write your information to both sd cards so if one breaks and you're doing a forty thousand dollar commercial the second one will still have the information and the last thing i want to talk about and this determines whether you love your camera or not for a long time to come. Because you might get a camera that you like right now, but you might get bored of the lenses, or you may not like the lenses that that company offers. For example, I love Fuji cameras. I think they look amazing. I cannot get myself to buy one right now because I hate the lenses. They don't have good autofocus. They're too expensive. Like Fuji lenses are such a bad deal for the most part. So I will never buy a Fuji camera, but I love Canon cameras. I love their lenses, great lenses. I love Sony cameras. I love their lenses. And most people go with Sony and Canon simply because they have better quality lenses for less money and it's easier to get into that ecosystem. So look into what the lens ecosystem of your camera brand is. With that being said, there's something I should mention. You could get the best camera on the planet. You could spend all of your money. But if you don't actually know how to properly use that camera, learn how to harness the power of that camera, if you will, and fine tune it so that the images coming out of it are exactly what you need, you're never going to truly be happy with a camera system. So if you wanna take a beginner camera, a mid-range camera, whatever camera you have, and you wanna learn how to make it look good, I have a free training for you guys. It's in the links in the description down below. It only takes about an hour to go through. You can take it at your own pace. You're going to get dramatically better photos and videos. You're not gonna to have to spend as much money on expensive camera to get better images. And overall, it's going to help you fall in love with the camera you have, get better at photography, fall in more love with this hobby, or even turn it into a professional aspiration one day. Make sure to check out those seven simple tips in the links down below. It's a completely free training, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you get a lot out of this. With that being said, guys, if you have any questions about the things we talked about today, hit me up. I'm right here. Hit me up in the comments. I'll make sure to get back to all of you. And if you wanna check out the free training, let me know what you think of it, and I will either see you in the next video or in the training. Peace.